Welcome to The Celebration, a place for leadership, inclusion, and expression. Let's snap it up for living the best version of ourselves. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to The Celebration. It's a pleasure to have you join us. We have a special guest and a special episode this week. We wanted to kind of, you know, do a little interruption of our normally scheduled programs because we want to be responsive to what's going on, stay relevant, and empower you with tools you can use to create an inclusive world. So with me, I have the brilliant, the amazing, my brother, Hassan Shibley. How's it going, brother? Hey, Tom. It's always uh, great to talk to you, brother. Appreciate you having me here today. It's my absolute pleasure. Uh, how, how do you usually introduce yourself or what's some of the best intros you've heard someone give before you, you speak? You know, I'm not a fan of intros. I'm, I'm honored to be your friend. And I think that that's sufficient. Um, my daytime job is a civil rights attorney. Uh, I'm director of care Florida. It's a civil rights organization and really, um, not to sound too, uh, you know, uh, sound bitey, but, but we really work for, for a society where children of all people regardless of race or religion, can grow proud of who they are. And that's really what I've committed my life to. You know, I came from Syria when I was uh, four years old and uh, really have learned uh, to not only to appreciate the freedom and liberty we have here, but that we can easily lose it. So just a civil rights attorney uh, running a nonprofit, trying to keep America safe and free and making amazing uh, good friends like you, Tom, uh, along mean, the way. <laughs> that was an awesome intro. <laughs> <laughs> So humble brag, humble brag. Right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I hope that gives for our listeners context to why we're having, uh, you know, you on the show today. So what's, what's your, your week's been like? Oh Some- my God, it, Tom, it has been like the most difficult week that I can recall. I mean, seriously, um, for myself personally, um, career wise and for the American Muslim community, um, since 9-11. And frankly, one of the most challenging times for this country. And actually, I was talking to friends yesterday and they said, man, I feel like we're in a different place. I don't feel like we're in the America that we know. But then I corrected myself and said, wait a minute, we're not in a different place. We're in a different time. Mm-hmm. Because America has had periods in its history and continues to struggle with where it targets and marginalizes and hurts people based on superficial things. You know, you, you had the Chinese Exclusion Act, you had the internment of Japanese Americans, you've had times where, where Jewish refugees were turned away. Um, and unfortunately, we're seeing a resurgence, uh, reemergence of some very scary uh, forces in our country that, that demonize uh, the other. And in doing so really undermine our liberty. It's been crazy. My phones have been going off the hook. I cannot keep up. But if, if, if any of your uh, uh, viewers have, have tried to message me on Facebook or WhatsApp and ask a legal question or ask for help and I haven't responded, I'm sorry. And I promise I'm going to try to get to you this weekend. But we just can't keep up with the calls for help. It, it's been insane. I believe it, brother. We, we appreciate what you're doing. And I pray that Allah gives you strength and guidance, brother. Amen. All of us. Amen. Amen. What are some frequently asked questions you see coming your way that we could kind of send people to this as a resource. Excellent, excellent. So look, the obviously what we're dealing with is, is this ban, right? This ban, uh, what we've called the Muslim ban, the refugee ban. I mean, you, you got the guy who was elected as president of the country, before he was elected said, Islam hates us. He said he wants a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the country. And then he said that he wants a registry for Muslims in this country. I mean, imagine like, you know, if you're, if you're a Jewish American hearing somebody elected saying that, you know, Judaism hates us and I want to ban Jews and I want a registry of Jews, what do you think is coming next? You know, it's very scary. It's very scary rhetoric. So now that he's in office, he enacted this ban very recklessly and callously to, to an extent where, it, you know, people on the ground didn't know what to do in terms of from the government side. So it was being applied in different ways in different parts of the country. Um, and a lot of career officers within the government objected to the ban, objected to how it was going to be implemented. And Bannon, who's a known, you know, just white supremacist, Islamophobe, anti-Semitic uh, bigot, frankly, um, whispered in Trump's ear and made him overrule all the career civil servants' advice on how bad of an idea this was. Um, but the point is, it was done so haphazardly and callously that people just didn't know how it would affect them. And there was a lot of questions, you know, in the initial hours of the ban, uh, and initial days, really, there were people who are coming into the U.S. on green card that, you know, had trouble coming back into the country. They didn't know who this ban would affect. 
Um, so what we quickly did is we tried to do some viral social media videos to educate people. And there's some, there's been some key points. I think it's very important for people to know about this ban and how it affects them. Um, number one, initially the ban did affect even green card holders, which is very troubling because, you know, I was a green card holder for a long time in my life till, you know, I got my citizenship when I was in high school, but you know, frankly, I don't think I was less of an American when I was a green card holder. I mean, I grew up in this country since I was four, you know, watched, you know, ate and acted just like any other American teenager kid, you know what I'm saying, for better or worse. Uh, <laughs> you know, exactly. Yeah. So, but, but this was my home. My family's here. My school is here. I didn't have a home anywhere else in the world. You know, my parents didn't have a career or life anywhere else in the world. We were green card holders. And it was just shocking to see uh, even green card holders who spent their whole life here potentially not being able to come back. So we've sent different warnings to the community at different times. Now, initially it was said, uh, first of all, let, let's just be clear. If you're from one of those seven countries that, that is banned uh, on that list, even if you're not, if you're from a Muslim majority country and you're not a U.S. citizen, right now it's better to avoid travel outside of America. It just, we don't know what's happening. It, it, it's, it's been very messy. So if you can avoid outside travel, avoid outside travel. Uh, okay. That's the first thing. And number two, initially we were saying that this applies even to green card holders. And it did in the way they were applying it. I mean, one of the worst stories I heard was a Somali American mother who's a green card holder was coming in from overseas with her two U.S. citizen children. Wow. But because she was not a U.S. citizen, she and her U.S. citizen children were held for over 20 hours at wow. the airport by oh customs. My gosh. Effectively arrested, effectively detained, and without even proper food. She wasn't even food for 20 hours with her two wow. American kids and possibly fearing that she would be denied entry into the United States. Wow. You know, it's insane. And that's what's so troubling about this. Like thousands of lives were, were just callously devastated for no reason. And, and I want to talk about that, how there's really no reason. I mean, of the seven countries that are banned, um, there has been absolutely zero terrorist attacks in America that resulted in fatality in over 40 years from wow. anybody from those seven attacks. So it's not about keeping America safe. The chances of being killed by a refugee is one in 3.6 billion with a B. <laughs> wow. Billion with B, according to the Cato Institute. It's not keeping America safe. You know, you're actually, Tom, I mean, I love your plaid shirt, but you're more likely to be killed by that plaid shirt getting light, lit on fire <laughs> than you are to be killed by an immigrant. Oh, my right? gosh. This is all according to the Cato Institute. I highly encourage people to check out the Cato Institute that's documenting all this. You're actually, I mean, if you, you know, you're, if you visit San Francisco, you're more likely to be killed by a runaway like tram or railway car than yeah. you are to be killed by an immigrant. All right. So it's not about keeping America safe, but what it has been about was pandering to fear and pandering to hate. You know, what's, what's troubling is Giuliani, he went on the record saying, you know, Trump called me and said, hey, how can I legally do a Muslim ban? Wow. Um, th Trump has gone on the record saying, we're going to make exceptions for Christian refugees. We're going to give them preference. Wow. Right. He himself said he wants a Muslim ban. So it's very clearly discriminatory. It's bad for the country and it's caused a lot of confusion. So again, to, be, to go get back to the advice, um, if you are not a U.S. citizen, uh, and you're from a Muslim majority country, especially from those seven countries, it's better to avoid travel right now because we just don't know what's happening. So don't leave the United travel. States if you're here. Don't, don't leave. It's, yeah, don't leave if you're here. Um, people don't realize, like I was at the University of Florida. They have over 200 students right now here on a visitor, on a student visa from one of those seven banned countries. Um, and I spoke to the university president. He's completely against the ban. He said, this is devastating our, our students. Uh, I'm like, what's your advice to the students? He said, we're telling them not to go anywhere, stay here. Because if they right. leave, they won't be able to come back. Um, so well, let's talk about some key advice based on your status. Okay. If, uh, I'm going to start with green card holders. Okay. If you're a green card holder, um, initially the ban was banning you, okay. which is crazy. Now, uh, through lawsuits and through some clarifications, now the latest is that no, if you're a green card holder, even from those seven countries, you're supposed to be allowed in the country. You just may face enhanced scrutiny and questioning. They're going to ask you a lot of crazy questions, and they're going to search your phone and your social media. So if you are traveling outside the country and you're a green card holder from those seven countries, be ready for enhanced scrutiny when you're coming back. Can, can they do that? Right now, they are. I mean, that's okay. the reality, uh, unfortunately. You know, we, it's our argument that they should not be asking about religious questioning, uh, but they are. They're asking about how many times a day do you pray. They wow. revoke somebody's visa because they found the Quran app or, and the iPray app in their iPhone. Wow. Uh, and if you're, not, excuse me, if you're not an American citizen, you really can't resist them too much in searching your phone and in answering their questions. So if you're a green card holder, um, again, I would just avoid traveling outside of the country if you're from those seven countries. But know that 
technically you're supposed to be able to come back. You, you, sh you should be able to come back, but you will face enhanced questioning. Now, my advice for people coming back and facing enhanced questioning is answer basic questions but if they start asking about your religious beliefs or your political beliefs, you know, find a very nice way of saying, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable answering questions about my religion. Can I speak to a supervisor? And just be very docile and very nice and answer very broadly and be ready to have your phone search and your social media search. Uh, okay. so just keep, keep all that in mind. That's for uh, uh, green card holders. Next, I want to talk about dual nationals. There was some time where people were saying, and they were, that's how they were acting it out, where if you were a dual national, for example, if you had a Syrian citizenship and a Canadian citizenship, you would not be allowed in the country. Gotcha. Because one of your citizenship is from those seven countries. Um, now the answer is this, which is that if you come in, uh, as long as you come in on a passport that is not banned, and you have a visa to come in, you should be fine. So for example, I had some friends of the family who were in Canada uh, visiting their sick mother, and they're Canadian citizens, but born in Syria. And initially in the first couple of days that we were afraid they couldn't come back in because they're here on a work visa and they're Syrian uh, citizens as well. And they were saying that they will even block dual nationals. Then the clarification came out uh, after causing a lot of fear and hysteria, the clarification came out that if you are, if you come in on a leg uh, passport, not from a banned country, like from a uh, Canadian passport, you should be fine. So we are hearing that dual nationals now, as long as they come in, on a, an, an allowed passport, they'll be fine. So my Canadian citizen friend, who's also born in Syria, she came in today uh, on a Canadian uh, passport and she was fine with her children, uh, no problem. So it, it, it hasn't been applied at, at this point now to dual nationals, they're all right. Um, I will tell you though, for those who are not dual nationals and who are simply visa holders, most of those visas have been revoked. There's some court fighting about whether that revocation counts or not. For those guys, you know, definitely before traveling, and really for everybody who's not a U.S. citizen, before traveling, consult with an immigration attorney to see what the latest is uh, by the time they're watching this and, and if you are allowed in or not, and what legal challenges and what legal options you have. Um, finally, for American citizens, I will say this, that even American citizens who are of the Muslim community, they're being selected for enhanced scrutiny. And they're being asked ridiculous questions. I've had people being asked, how many times a day do you pray? Are you mm. a devout Muslim? Uh, what do you think of Moses and Jesus? What do you think of killing non-Muslims? I mean, just ridiculous things. Wow. You know, just inappropriate things, ineffective things. Also ask for their cell phone access. Also ask for their social media information. So my advice for American citizens is uh, be ready to be subjected to enhanced questioning at this time. Um, however, understand these two key points. Number one is if you're an American citizen, you know, they have to let you in the country. You know, they can't deny you entry, uh, number one. Uh, number two is when you're traveling and you reach primary inspection, answer the basic questions, where you come from, where you're going, make sure to make any required declarations. Like if you're bringing any fruits or vegetables, um, if you're bringing more than $10,000 in currency as a group, you have to declare it. So answer those questions. If you get selected for secondary inspection, um, and mind you, the chances of being selected for secondary inspection is 1%. Okay. One percent of travelers gets, but if you're Muslim, it's like fifty to seventy-five percent. That's true. Yeah. You know, you go in the room. Like every time I go to secondary inspection, I feel at home because I feel like I'm at the local mosque. You know, it's literally everybody from the local mosque is there. You know, and and that's the sad thing. You look around; it stands of getting stopped is one percent, and one percent of the population are Muslim. Yeah. However, on the ground, the truth of the matter is. Um, 50 to 75 percent of those stopped for secondary are Muslim, and 50 percent of American Muslims often get stopped for secondary inspection. So it is disproportionately targeting the American Muslim community. If you get selected for secondary inspection, again, if they ask you basic questions that you feel comfortable asking, it's fine. Answer them. Where'd you come from? Where you're going? But the minute they start asking about your social media or your political or religious beliefs, uh, at that point you should say, "Sir, I'm an American citizen." I don't feel comfortable asking these, uh, answering these personal questions. Let me speak to a supervisor and either give me a lawyer or let me go home, you know, and then just sit down and don't, don't answer any questions about your personal or political or religious beliefs. Also, while you do have to provide them with your phone, if they ask for it, you are under no obligation to unlock it or provide them with your cell phone password. You're under no obligation to do that. Now, they may threaten of keeping your phone longer if, they, if you do that or keeping it overnight. And it's true, they can do that. But in my experience, they've actually kept it more frequently when you open it for them because then they can go to the data. Gotcha. Um, uh, so the chances of them keeping you longer or keeping your phone exists whether you open it or not. 
but I think that you're more likely to get held up longer if you do open it for them. And you're, at the end of the day, you're more likely to get yourself in some sort of trouble uh, if, if they have access to your personal data for one way or another. Um, so just remember that. And then once you get out, file a complaint, call care, let us know that this happened to you so we can document these incidents of discrimination. So in a nutshell, for American citizens, uh, remember you have to be allowed in the country. Um, you don't ever, ever, ever have to answer questions about your personal, political, or religious beliefs or your social media. You have the right generally to remain silent, answer basic questions about where you came from, where you're going, be honest, never lie to them, make any required declarations. But remember, they have to let you in. You don't have to answer any personal religious questions. You don't have to unlock or provide them your, your cell phone password. If you're a non-citizen, just very simply, uh, especially if you're from a Muslim majority country, please, please, please consult with an immigration attorney before leaving. Generally, green card holders are supposed to be let in and dual nationals coming in on an allowed passport should be let in. Um, visa holders right now sim seem to be not be, uh, be let in. However, there's th those are changing with some court rulings. So just consult with an immigration attorney before leaving this country or before trying to come back if you're not an American citizen. Wow. That you are like a wealth of information, brother. <laughs> that. So, somebody uh, mailed in a question or emailed in a question. And they said that, so their, their parents are immigrants, but now they're U.S. citizens. And she herself was born here. So she's a U.S. citizen. And they're going to a Muslim majority country. They're going to Pakistan. So it's not one of the banned ones, but with, sure. with something like that, what do you, and it's this month, like they're going in the next week or so. And I appreciate this because my inbox is flooded with these kind of questions. So okay. I'm glad I get to answer this, you know, uh, effectively here so everybody can hear. Look, if you're a U.S. citizen, just remember this. You cannot be denied entry into America. All right. Don't do anything illegal while overseas, you know, uh, just because it's, it's simply wrong to do. You know, uh, don't try to bring in anything illegal. Don't lie to the federal agents. Make sure that you declare whatever you're required to declare, which is generally, you know, fruits and vegetables and, uh, you know, a currency as a group over $10,000 or the equivalent thereof. You know, so make those declarations, but be ready that you may face enhanced questioning when you come back and just, just know that you got nothing to worry about, really. You have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about at most, at most. And this is the truth. You may be held for a couple hours at customs. I've been going through this since I was a kid. It's not at the end of the world. Bring a book, sit and read, you know, don't answer questions. I, I like when, when they hold me for secondary, I get whoever else is most of my round them up. I say, it's time to do our salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And we just do our salah there. We, we pray. I start giving lectures about how uh, beautiful Islam is in a very uh, loud fashion. So people, uh, so I can make, take advantage of this opportunity. You know, don't be obnoxious. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm known as a troublemaker, you know, and I'm a lawyer. So but you're careful. also an attorney. So let's just put that out there. Let's you put that out there. But in, exactly, exactly. But in reality, look, if you get held up, you know, don't be rude. Don't make a scene, you know, never physically resist. Just sit down quietly, read a book, answer their basic questions. If they ask you about your uh, questions, you're not comfortable. Just say, I don't, I'm not comfortable answering. Remember, they have to let you in and be ready to face enhanced questioning. That's all I can say is that be ready that they may ask you as a U.S. citizen, they may ask you a lot of questions. You don't have to answer them. We have documented how they've actually shared your, those answers with the FBI and then people have received follow up visits. Gotcha. Um, so I'm not discouraging absolutely not discouraging U.S. citizens from traveling. U.S. Okay. citizens should travel, uh, go for Umrah, go for Hajj, go visit your uncle in, in Pakistan and have some good biryani, you know, do what you got to do. Just when you're coming back, they may just, they may ask you extra questioning. And if they do, just remember, they have to let you in. Don't let them scare you. Don't let them intimidate you. Don't answer questions about your political religious beliefs. Um, I would not unlock my cell phone um, and I would not uh, give them my password and I would be ready for the fact that they may hold on to it. So keep that in mind. If you want to keep another phone while you travel, that's, that's your pr right to do. Um, and then if they, if they ask you an appropriate question, just tell them, I, I don't feel comfortable answering these questions. Just wait. And they have to let you in nothing to worry about. Okay. And file a complaint though. Cause we got to challenge this and we can't challenge it. If people remain silent about it. Where do they file the complaint? So go to care.com and file a complaint at care.com. And that will connect you with your local care office as well. So if you have a strong care office like Chicago, Florida, California, Ohio, even New York, you know, um, you can go right to your state's care chapter and file a complaint. Otherwise, if you don't know, just go to care.com, file a complaint, let us know what's happening. We need to document it because frankly, we have a lot of friends inside the government and they say, you know, it's very difficult for us to challenge these policies. We know what's happening, but unless we have formal complaints, it's tough for us to push back and, and create positive change. And that's C-A-I-R dot com. That Correct. C-A-I-R dot com. Yes. Okay. 
brother, how do you yourself maintain? How do you not lose hope? How do you stay on this path of civil rights? How do you do that? Thank you. I mean, that's a great question. And it isn't easy. I mean, honestly, it's been very challenging times. And to be honest, a lot of times, look, challenges more come internally uh, than externally. You know, you're facing a you know, one of the most difficult times as a community. And then, you know, you, you know, personally, I like to move, I move very fast, but I got to remember, I got to slow down for the team. Um, You know, some people may doubt your intention. Some people may doubt your strategy, you know, um, you know, you can't win when it comes to trying to please everyone. It's very important to be a team player. I'm trying to teach myself a lesson, which is, you know, if you want to go fast, it's a, it's an African proverb that if you want to run fast, if uh, run alone, but mm. if you want to run far, then run in a group. Um, you know, that's very beautiful. and It's very yeah. true. Um, it is important to maintain good relationships, to communicate better with your team and your friends and your family, not take, not take those relationships for granted. Uh, for me, it's important to remind myself that I'm doing everything ultimately to please my creator, right? I mean, because, you know, God created us and he tests us to see who of us will respond in the best of ways. And we cannot honor God if we don't honor his creation. And the greatest way to get close to God is to serve his creation. God is not found in the church or the mosque. He's found in the service of others. So remind myself to do all this, serving him purely for his sake, not to please people, not to make people happy, but to make him happy. And I'm not responsible for the results. I'm responsible for my efforts. So I remind myself, I'm inspired by the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him. He said, look, if the day of judgment were about to start and you have a seed, plant the seed, mm. right? Nobody, you know, that tree's not going to grow. Nobody's going to benefit from its fruit or shade, but you're not responsible for the results. You're responsible for your effort. So two things. One is purifying the intention, reminding myself I'm doing it for God and putting forth my best effort and not giving up hope you know, combining the effort and, and the prayer. And secondly is trying to take some time every single day to disconnect and reconnect with God. You know, very important, some meditation, some prayers, uh, just reminding myself, you know, just sitting quietly reminding myself, God sees me, God hears me, he is with me, I am with him. You know, he, you know he's all around me, uh, he's all powerful, almighty, I'm doing this all for him. And then speaking to him directly, you know, I'm trying my best, please help me, guide me, forgive me. Uh, bless me. You know, you know, I'm struggling with this. I need help with this. Just having an open conversation with the creator every night, reestablishing that connection where we worship God as though we see him and knowing that even though we don't see him, he sees us keeping that connection strong, even for 10, 15 minutes a night, it goes a long way. Um, so, you know, make some time for family and make some time to, you know, rekindle that heart and fix that intention. Keep that connection with the divine strong. And then you work, 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 work as much as you can, because we got, we got to work harder, I think, to express our love than others are working to express their hatred. I mean, very beautiful said, brother. And we do have uh, Brother Shibley. He, he loves quotes as well. And so for your free download this week, he's going to share with us his top quotes in addition to the ones he's already dropped. So if you want to download those, just head over to tomerl.com slash blog, click on Brother Shibley's blog, and you can get those. So very much appreciated and correct me if i'm wrong was it the seed of an olive tree that you're supposed to plant or did did i hear that part through the grapevine incorrectly i, I don't know personally if it's that specific okay. or not i don't know but yeah i mean okay. just pl- pl- plant the seed uh and of course one of the best of t- seeds is the olive tree seed that's for sure because i heard that like an olive tree takes like 50 to 100 years to plant and so yeah even it's something true. that you're planning for 50 to 100 years even if you think the end is near that you should still continue your intention of making good, which to me speaks to don't let hopelessness come over. That even Never. if you feel like it's hopeless, we should still try to strive for good. So hopelessness re- is from the devil, my brother. Don't yeah. never give in to hopelessness. hopelessness Expand upon that for me. Well, you know, he wants people, I believe, you know, I believe in the devil and I believe the devil wants people to be hopeless, I, uh, you know, to despair, to give up hope. Uh, Iblis comes from the word yes. Yes is to despair, despair in the mercy of God. God, nothing is difficult for God to do. And I believe these challenging times, you know, my philosophy in life, if you want a nutshell, is that God never takes, he only gives. And that we must have a good opinion of God. And if we have a good opinion of God, we will always find good. God never takes, he only gives. Every challenge is really an opportunity for us. And diamonds are only created under intense pressure. Yes, uh, you know, so under the pressure, you're going to give the diamonds are going to come out, you know, for the arrow to fly forward, you got to pull the bow backward. You know, so when things are going backward, God's getting ready to shoot us forward. Uh-huh. And I, I think the challenging times will bring out a, po- a lot of good things for us. So we just got to stay strong. We got to stay positive. And you know, one thing, by the way, Tom, I mean, I'll tell you this, and I, I mean this with love my heart. 
people like you, you're a tremendous inspiration for me, you know, and this past week, I've had so many opportunities to meet such diverse people who are standing in solidarity together to defend America, to defend the American Muslim community, defend civil rights, to defend the Latino American community, never underestimate the positive power of, of inspiration that we can all have on each other. You know, and just as maybe you may think I inspire you, you inspire me, we inspire each other. So stay positive and keep uplifting people. You know, there's enough people who are gloomy and doomy. And yes, things are challenging, but find ways to uplift each other and stay strong. And we put our trust in God. And we're going to put forth our best effort to, to, to make America great through our efforts and sacrifice. I mean, I mean, and just to share the, the literally the day I converted, some guy came up to me and slipped a card into my hand on the handwritten and said, if you ever need anything, call me. And that was brother Hassan. So you've been there since the beginning. I appreciate brother. that, brother. Alhamdulillah, it's my honor, brother. So talk to me about, you know, the, the, the different federal judges trying to block the rulings. Is, is there any success to that or what's, what's behind that? Can you explain a little bit of that strategy? That's a great question. You know, and there's a lot of conversations about how wrong, how immoral, unethical, ineffective these policies are. But ultimately, I, I believe they're also unconstitutional and illegal. And, I, you know, what we've seen happening over the past few days in terms of court rulings is, is a big uh, boon to that, that, that notion. Um, I, you know, what was extremely exciting, of course, is uh, some of the early preliminary injunctions uh, demanding people not be detained, demanding certain portions of this not, uh, the executive order not be enforced. And practically every ruling to this point that have come out in the executive orders, and there's been judges from California to Chicago, Boston, throughout the U.S. reviewing cases uh, regarding the executive orders, and every single ruling they've, uh, that's come out to this point has been in our favor. Um, so th that's been phenomenal. You know, a lot of these uh, district judges appointing favorably and putting temporary injunctions. Um, and you know, for an injunction to be issued, it's not an easy task. You got to show, you know, irreparable harm, which is I think quite obvious. But you also have to show that you have a good chance of winning. Uh, throughout the process. So they're already saying, yeah, it looks like these guys are going to win. Let's institute the, uh, you know, a ban on the ban. Let's institute an injunction on the executive orders. And I also think the fact that the acting attorney general, uh, Sally Yates, um, went on the record saying, I cannot def de de defend these executive orders. They're indefensible. They're unconstitutional. They're wrong. And they're bad for this country. And she actually lost her position. I mean, I think Donald Trump thought he was still on The Apprentice. And he's like, you're fired the minute she objected. <laughs> and that's not healthy. You need dissent within your administration. Exactly. Otherwise, you become as an autocracy. You know? exactly. So the fact that the acting attorney general is against it, the fact that the judges are ruling in our favor, really is strong evidence that these things, as we are saying, uh, are, not, uh, are not effective and not good for our country and are unconstitutional. And that's what's crazy. A lot of these people supporting these bans, they're all about the Constitution. They wrap themselves up in the American flag. But then when, like, after these orders came out and some CBP offices blatantly refused to obey the judge's orders, we didn't hear an outcry. If you care about the Constitution, you should care about the balance of power. You should be disgusted when an executive branch refuses to give in to the orders of the judicial branch. That's what our Constitution is founded on, this separation of powers and this balance of powers. And when one blatantly violates the balance and separation of powers, one is blatantly violating the U.S. Constitution and turning America more into an autocracy. So those who wrap themselves up in the flag, you should be the first to, to be outraged when, when the U.S. Constitution is disrespected in that manner. I mean, I mean, Amen. unless it's not about the Constitution, it's about your way of life being first. That's it. That's it. That's so it. speaking on that, so you were talking about working together with diverse groups of people. What do you think non-Muslims who really want to affect change and stand in solidarity, what do you recommend that they do? Excellent, excellent question. Um, I've really been uplifted by our brothers and sisters of various faiths. Um, who have stood in solidarity with us and, and different beliefs and different mindsets, you know, from humanists and atheists to uh, Jewish Americans, um, uh, Hindu Americans, Sikh Americans, Christian Americans, people of all different faiths and backgrounds, S just standing in solidarity, recognizing the attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. Find, you know, connect with the local Muslim community and see what effort is out there. If there's a protest at an airport, join them. If there's a push to make your community, your county or your city, a, a sanctuary city or sanctuary county, support that effort. Um, volunteer with your local organizations, even donate. One thing that I have right now on my desktop that we're changing, and I'm going to put a link, and if you can share this out, I'd appreciate it. I we're will. doing a, a, a change for change campaign <laughs> where we've developed an app just launching today, actually, um, that people can download the Care Florida app 
and commit their credit card change from their credit card transactions to go to support our effort to challenge Islamophobia and defend civil rights. And it won't cost anybody anything. It's your change on your credit card, maybe 20, 30 bucks a month. But if everybody does that, it would go a long way to help us challenge this injustice. So just stand in solidarity, you know, support us, you know, digitally on social media, support financially, but also support with standing in solidarity at protests and calling your elected officials and just network with those doing the work on the ground. You don't have to reinvent it, see what they're doing and see how you can contribute your various skill sets to it. We all have something we can offer. You know, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said that people are all mines of gold and silver. You just got to cultivate it out. Everybody's got good. Find the good that you can contribute and do the best. And don't waste your time trying to be the best at what you're not good at. You know, some people, they can't, they're not good at volunteering, but they can donate. Some people, they're not in a position to donate, but they can volunteer. Don't sweat yourself worrying about what you can't do. Do what you can do best. We all have a different path to God. We just got to find our path to God. You know, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he taught that the person who eats and is grateful is equal to the one who is fasting and is patient. So some people, their way to God is through patience. Some people, their way to God is through gratitude. But they're all heading in the same direction. Don't try to take somebody else's path. Take your own path. Find what you can contribute best and most effectively and do it and be the best at what you do. (laughs) Civil rights and inspiration. Amen. Amen. Brother, we want to respect your time. So I just want to ask you just two more questions. Sure. There are ones people uh, sent in and you brought them up. Okay, what in terms of people's rights should people be aware of when they do protest? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, first of all, just as general advice to all people within the country, with, especially if you're in the country, I'm not talking about the border right now, but within the country, whether you're a citizen or not, whether you're uh, here documented or undocumented, whatever your situation is, remember that you are never under any obligation you know, to speak to law enforcement without an attorney except in very rare circumstance. And even then your attorney will let you know about those circumstances. So uh, my advice for everybody is just, if you know, whatever you're doing, never speak to the uh, FBI without a lawyer, unless there's like a life and death situation emergency, of course, you know, we can make exceptions, but generally uh, you, you, you're never under obligation. Cause what I'm talking about is somebody protests and then the FBI is there and they want to interview them or they show up at their workplace or home. Um, don't be intimidated. Don't be scared. Uh, just never ever speak to the FBI without a lawyer. You have freedom to assemble, you have freedom to protest, uh, you have freedom to challenge authority, and you're never under obligation to speak to law enforcement without an attorney present. So exercise that right, otherwise it becomes meaningless. In America, you know, you can't talk yourself out of trouble, but you can talk yourself into trouble, even if you've done nothing wrong. Those who say I've done, I, I have nothing to hide, they get in trouble the most uh, because they simply just don't know what they're doing. Uh, the founding fathers put the right to remain silent to protect innocent people not to protect guilty people. So exercise that right, go out and protest. But if you're ever approached by some government agency, because I don't know, I feel like Trump takes everything personal. So like people are protesting him. He may try to like, all right, send the FBI to interrogate them. See, you know, see what they think of me. You know, I mean, he was waging war on Twitter. Now he can wage Twitter war with the full resources of the federal government. It's scary. Yes. So just don't give into that. Don't speak to them without a lawyer. You, you have the right to gather. Definitely, I do advise people to, you know, connect with the local organizers. They will tell you, for example, some places do require permits. Um, some places, you know, places you can and things you can and can't do. Just consult with your local people. Follow that up, you know. And sometimes there is room for healthy civil disobedience, but that should be coordinated and done with the advice uh, and guidance of lawyers and, and professionals on the ground. So, uh, but don't be afraid to protest. That's what makes America great is our right to challenge government and hold those in authority accountable. Look, our job is not to please our government. That's, that's what people in, in dictatorships and fascist regimes do. Our job is to hold our government accountable. And there that's it is. What we will do. <laughs> so last question, and you can, if you could also give the link to where we could get that change for change. If somebody said, you know, in times like this, unfortunately, there's people who try to use donations as a scam. So what do you think are some reputable places people could donate to, including if you could share the links to donate to Care, which you're the executive director of and freely gave your time today? Just Absolutely. Wanted. Thank you. So number one is if you want to support, you know, Care Florida, go to careflorida.org, C-A-I-R, florida.org. Um, that's a great, that's a great, uh, obviously, website. And we, you know, um, I mean, we give back to the community about 10 times the money that we take in. 
we give it back in service. Uh, I'm very proud of the Care Florida organization. Care.com, obviously, if you want to support the nat nationwide care office or, or find your local chapter, um, go to care.com. Uh, ACLU's done phenomenal work um, and support your ACLU. Of course, they've also raised like almost $30 million in the past few weeks. Uh, so uh, I, I, I am biased towards care. We need the research. We didn't raise anywhere near that. Uh, <laughs> so support but ACLU. The other thing is I'm a big fan of the website launchgood.com. Uh, L-A-U-N-C-H-G-O-O-D, launchgood.com. We actually have a campaign up there. Uh, I know their leaders and I know they, they really do a great job vetting each and every fundraising cause. It's sort of like a Kickstarter or a GoFundMe or Indiegogo for nonprofit causes and for community causes, but they do a great job vetting it. Be, definitely be aware of scams, um, but just go to those that you trust. You know, so, you know, Care, um, Care Florida, LaunchGood to, to help various causes. Um, and keep us in your prayers, man. I mean, those are just as important as the donations as people's prayers. That's what gets us through these challenging times. I mean, brother, I mean, I want to thank you so much. I want to, you know, offer my dua that Allah rewards you and this life and the hereafter and you and your family keeps the care team strong and all those Amen. around the world who are working towards creating a better world. Amen. Thank you, brother. And keep up the great work and keep being a beautiful message uh, voice in, the, in these challenging times. We need that. It's a beacon of hope. Thank you for being a beacon of hope for everyone. My pleasure, brother. Where can people, I know you're saying your inbox is flooded. So where can people reach care or what, if they want to give a shout out for how awesome this was today, what should they do? Awesome. So uh, the care national website, care.com from that, you can find your local care office careflorida.org is our local one to keep in touch with me. You can definitely follow me at Twitter. It's at, and then my first name, last name at Hassan Shibley or on facebook.com forward slash H Shibley. I'm really active on Facebook. I'm trying to keep real time updates for the community about what's going on. So I definitely encourage people to you know reach out on, uh, on Facebook and follow me there. Um, if you do have questions, I do advise people to, call the institution as opposed to the individual, just because, you know, you can have one person, me answer your question, or you can have a whole institution do a proper intake and process. So reach out. If, if, if you like, you're also, people are welcome to message me on Facebook. Just know it may take me forever to get back, but I am trying to stay on top of it because I do believe in, in answering questions. I, you know, what, what I love about Islam is the greatest act of worship is to enter peace and happiness into the hearts of others around you Oof. and to relieve their difficulties. Um, so to get to do that every single day by giving people peace of mind, answering the questions, helping them out is so rewarding. And it's such an honor to be able to do that. And, and, if, and these were the quotes that he's been giving away now. So wait till y'all see the ones on your free giveaway this week. So for that one, you can just head over to tomrell.com slash blog and scroll down to this podcast. Brother, once again, I love you. You are amazing. I'm so glad that you're in my life and I appreciate you taking this time today. Thank you, brother. I love you too. And I'm honored to call you a brother and a friend. Let's keep in touch and hopefully, hopefully we'll see you soon. Sounds good. Inshallah. inshallah. And thank you everybody for listening today. If you have any follow-up questions, please let me know. But you know, like brother Shibley said, whatever you can do, we all have a gift. We all have something within us, a way that I can say something that you can't and vice versa, that somebody will need to hear it just from you. So just with your own, my grandma always used to say, with your own small sphere of influence, there's somebody within there that you can affect just by using your voice and saying, you know what, I, I can articulate why, but I just have to say I disagree and I think it's wrong. And just that alone, you don't have to have 100 facts to back it up. Just to say it plants a seed in somebody's mind. And that could be the seed we've been talking about. I mean, it's not the olive tree, it's the seed in people's mind. So once again, everybody, thank you for tuning in. We wish you peace and blessings. God bless you.